backtracking a little bit uh, yesterday, we talked, we started talking about theories that try to explain multiple types of intelligence. Howard Gardner did do a decent job of unveiling that uh, uh, there are like savants and extreme cases like on the autism spectrum where uh, you can have a high ability in one, you know, form of an, or factor of intelligence, but, uh, you know, be average or below average or much lower on the others. However, uh, Gardner and these other three theories, well, I am going to teach them to you, of course, because they might be on the AP test. Just again, know that they don't um, have much to stand on regarding evidence. And uh, we've looked in this a lot. Just don't forget, intelligence itself is the most looked after, scientifically studied, uh, psychologically studied uh, topic. Like, there's no nothing else do we have as much concise information on as that one topic. Am I recording, by the way? I forgot to hit it. Okay. So, uh, let's look at that real quick. So I want to revisit Gardner for a second. Tyler Gardner. So you believe in intelligence packages and multiple intelligences. And there's the other theories by uh, Robert Sternberg uh, with his uh, three types. All right, so we had creative, we had analytical we had practical and then we have um, Daniel Goleman with uh, emotional intelligence uh, remind me why this topic is so controversial this uh, intelligence topic like why there's so many people coming after it trying to explain different ways of measuring it, different types, and, and all of that. Because it's mostly genetic, and when people find out that there's a cap, they're like, no, they can't be. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's hard for people to accept that premise, that, there, that there's a cap. Now, we already went over yesterday the fact that you should never judge anyone based on their group or as an individual out the gate, and we talked about why that's wrong with, uh, with our cultural explanation for knowledge and why certain civilizations did better, and how individuals always catch up. Uh, and in, in whatever group you're in or whatever individual you're talking to, uh, we don't know what their potential is. So we should never deny them the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, learn or have a stable environment where they get the nutrition and develop to the, reach their max potential. That is uh, something that we, we, we all agree on morally, I would hope anyway, uh, going forward. So um, intelligence. We talked about what we look for, basically. Reading patterns, logically analyzing how to use those to make accurate predictions. That's kind of a, a definition of intelligence. Um, one of the ways we know it exists and we know it's accurate is, actually I think I told you this yesterday, how do we know our intelligence measures are accurate? Maybe I didn't tell you yesterday. All right. Um, what's one thing we, we try to use intelligence to do in life? As far as when I become an adult. Like, what, what am I using my intelligence for, specifically? That could be, you could measure it. Okay, yeah, problem solving, but uh, when, when do I use that the most, <coughs> would you say, compared to other people, even like competing with other people? Making decisions. Yes, what kind of decisions, or where would I be making a lot of these decisions? In my life, certainly, but like, what, what, what part of my life would I, would somebody with high intelligence do better at than somebody who's got average or below average intelligence? Give me a specific domain. Is it your career? Your career, yes, exactly. So career success, but we can do other domains too, like just overall success in life, uh, as far as you know, happiness with relationships and, and uh, success in other categories uh, regarding happiness and things like that. But um, one, one, one excellent way of measuring is, uh, of course, your career success. And we already talked about that, right? There's a, there's a, there's a correlation coefficient of about 0. 0.6. Is that a high or a low correlation? It's high, right. It's not the only thing, obviously, otherwise it'd be a one, uh, but it's, uh, it's the highest one above like conscientiousness or what they call uh, grit and perseverance. Um, so how can I tell if somebody is going to uh, be, how could I, hmm, how can I phrase this? Just because you're intelligent doesn't mean you're gonna be successful. We know that, otherwise, like I said, the correlation would be a one, it'd be perfect. <laughs> intelligent people, all successful. Um, but there's a way I can measure and predict very, very accurately how well you are all going to do in university, in college, and in your actual careers, too. Does anybody know what that is, what I could do to figure that out? Yeah. 
Yes, it's an aptitude test, an IQ test. So does anybody know how to make IQ tests, by the way? Because again, these, this is a highly uh, uh, criticized topic. So basically what they do is they take a uh, large set of questions, it could be thousands, like a test bank, and it's random things about you know, uh, spatial things, mathematic questions, word problems, uh, knowing the meanings of words, explaining things, whatever it might be. And they throw them all in this test bank and they can pull out any set of questions they want from these 10,000. They could pull out 100 questions, boom, give a test to everybody, all right? You get a percentile ranking. What does percentile ranking mean? Yeah, how, how highly you rank out of 100, right? That'd be a percentile. IQ kind of does that as well. What it does is it looks at you compared to people your age. And the reason why we use age as a marker is uh, because <clears throat> it's not fair for like you guys to take an intelligence test um, with compared to somebody. Like if you take a test from those, like I pull 100 questions out and give them to you and you're 16, 17. Mm -hmm. Or you can have a fair shot against somebody who is uh, educated in college, has a master's or a PhD and they're 35. Mm -hmm. Why not? Is their fluid intelligence higher? Yes. No. Maybe, maybe not. What is probably almost certainly higher though? They're crystallized, right? So they're gonna know more. So why would I compare a 17 year old to a 35 year old? What should I compare 17 year olds to? Other 17 year olds, because you've had roughly the same amount of time and opportunity, as close as we can get to that anyway, uh, as a marker. So we pick the same age, I give you a, the test, you get your questions, and it's gonna rank you, all right? What we found is when you do this, you can take almost any 100 questions out of that 10,000 question bank and give it, and guess what the rankings are gonna be almost almost exactly for every single test we give. Are they gonna be different? There might be a little bit different. You might go like 91 percentile on another one and 87 on the next, but for the most part, are you gonna like drop significantly or raise significantly, do you think? No, it's gonna be pretty consistent. Uh, that's one way, and that's kind of essentially what an IQ test is. We give you a whole bunch of questions, and then we weigh you against how you perform compared to other people your age. And what you find is, it doesn't matter what questions I choose as bank of 10,000, the rankings are gonna be about the same. Like if you're a top performer, you're gonna be a top performer in almost all of the tests, or a middle performer, or a lower performer, whatever it might be, all right? So, what does that tell me about the uh, test itself? Reliable, not reliable? reliable. It's reliable, right? So whatever we're trying to measure here, in this case, what we've defined as intelligence, and it's arbitrary what we defined it as, right? Recognizing patterns and applying logically to, 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 uh, to uh, predict outcomes and understand things. Uh, what we have chosen, though, to label as intelligence, that does measure it very accurately. That method does. We'll talk more about it when we talk about the intelligence tests, but that's how we do it, essentially. All right, so... What test do you take that actually does impact which yeah. university you may go to and also may tell us how successful you're likely to be in your career? Your SATs. Yeah, SATs, right? Those are pretty much just intelligence tests, right? They don't call them IQ tests, but that's essentially what they are. It's like, here's a whole bunch of questions about a whole bunch of topics, and how you do is gonna be weighed uh, compared to the people that are also your age uh, going forward. That's what the universities look at. That's why you can also take it like 10 times if you want. Right? It's not gonna make much difference because you're gonna rank about the same regardless. Uh, we've been working on these for over 120 years. They have really got it down to the point that if I give a, a, an IQ test uh, to a toddler, it pretty accurately, uh, maybe not toddler, maybe grade school. Uh, if I give an IQ test to a grade school person, like fourth, fifth, sixth grade, certainly by junior high when your uh, frontal lobe is, is, is being connected by uh, adolescence and puberty, um, it's a really, really accurate predictor of exactly how you'll perform for the rest of your uh, epochs in life. So if I give you a, uh, a junior high IQ test, not IT, junior high Q, IQ test, your performance is going to be almost certainly very close and consistent as your performance if I give you the test in high school, and if I give the same test in college, and if I give that same test to those of you uh, in your various careers, or just look at how successful you are in your careers. It's extremely accurate. And you can go even further back but from junior high, but that's when it gets really accurate, because then, um, when we'll talk about this with developmental psychology, junior high and high school is when you hit puberty and your uh, frontal lobes really start uh, connecting you to the abstract logic and, and able to think hypothetically and all that. So these tests, uh, are very, very accurate in predicting how you're going to score uh, in all of these categories. So 
that's a good way to know that the uh, IQ tests are actually accurate. Uh, while our definition of intelligence is arbitrary, we did define it as something we're looking for. Right? We already discussed that, and this test does accurately measure it. All right. So um, this is a, a pretty good marker for success, by the way, testing your college performance. All right. You could say high school performance or test performance, whatever. But college performance is an excellent uh, marker for looking for intelligence. Um, do you think if you were a person that unfortunately had a very low intelligence, you would go to college and just kick ass and do well? No, you would not. You'd be overwhelmed. It would take you significantly longer uh, to learn things, maybe some things you couldn't learn or understand, certainly not in a reasonable amount of time, uh, and you would uh, struggle going through college. So these IQ tests uh, and, and intelligence itself is meant to, intended to measure for those things. So what people have done in the last 50 or years, years or so off and on is uh, uh, attempts like this where they don't like the narrow definition and they don't like that certain people aren't capable of, um, of, of improving, right, because you have this kind of genetic cap. We don't know what it is, of course, uh, for each individual, but since you do, they try to look at other ways to explain it. But here's the problems in their theories. And again, this isn't my opinion. I'm going off of what um, uh, primary psychological researchers who are in the field of intelligence study um, have criticized these for. So here's why, essentially. Um, well, Howard Gardner is right with his looking for savants and autism spectrum uh, differences. Uh, one thing he, that most people do disagree with regarding intelligence is he also thinks that you can have multiple intelligences like musical intelligence uh, or uh, body movement intelligence like dancing intelligence. We already have uh, words to describe those things. What, what do we call those things? Do we call those intelligence? Talent. We call them talent, right. You have a talent or, or an ability, right? Um, since we're using intelligence to predict our future performance in college or uh, in our career and our ability to solve problems, do you think that if I took a test in dance, it would be an accurate predictor of my performance in university or in my career? Yeah. It would not, right? If it was intelligence though, wouldn't they both be the same? Like let's say I took a dance test, whatever it would be, and I score super high. If it was intelligence, if it was the same thing, wouldn't that also align with my uh, SAT score or my IQ test score? Wouldn't they be the same thing if they're both intelligence? Yeah. Right, they'd both be able to, uh, they should be correlated at, at a one or a near one. But the only problem is things like musical intelligence or dancing or body movement intelligence, things like that, uh, they don't correlate at all uh, with your performance in like the uh, university system uh, or uh, even career success. Because I could be an excellent dancer, but if I can't figure out how to market or, or how to structure my business or what uh, business to join, I might not be successful. Uh, whereas if I was intelligent, my odds are higher that I'd be able to um, uh, go further uh, in my career, uh, whether it's my own, my own dance business or going through another one. Uh, so these are immediately uh, sort of thrown out because you cannot accurately use them to predict any of the markers that we've set for intelligence. Again, we could argue about the meaning of intelligence, fair enough, uh, but the meaning that we commonly have agreed on for the most part, uh, these do not align with that. They will not accurately predict any of your success uh, in any of those fields. So do we understand why most people have kind of rejected uh, Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences? All right, uh, moving on to uh, the next topic here. Um, Sternberg's, same thing. Creativity, unfortunately, as wonderful as it might be, is also not an accurate predictor of your performance in college. Uh, people that have high levels of creativity actually tend to do a little bit worse in college. Why do you think that might be? Because um, school is structured and they're not given the things. Yes, uh, so school is certainly a uh, much more structured approach. Like we have a curriculum, like we're learning these things and if you're gonna be creative and do things in new ways, it's like, well, I can't grade you or assess you on that. It's like if we wanna write an essay, a five paragraph essay, and you choose to be creative and you write, I don't know, uh, a series of three lined poems. It's like, well, this might be a wonderful for all I know, but I have no rubric or metric with which to measure or grade that, right? Because that's not a part of our uh, structured, analytical, argumentative reasoning. All right, so that might be creative, but that's not going to be uh, conducive of your, of your success. Um, also, creative people tend to be less organized. Not always, 
but they tend to be less organized. And organization uh, in school and even in your career are, are generally prerequisites for success. Like it's not easy to just go to, to go to college and just not pay attention and not follow deadlines. So you're, you're gonna do poorly if you don't do that. All right, um, so creativity, as, as wonderful and useful as it can be, and so can these two, by the way, guys. Like obviously if you have musical uh, or, or movement slash dancing talent or athletic ability, whatever, those are wonderful talents to have. Like good for you if you have them. Use them to your best of your ability. Uh, do the things you like to do. Make a good career out of it. Go right ahead. But it is not going to accurately measure what we're looking for as far as university and, and career success consistently. And again, we know this because it goes pretty consistently. You can start at a very young age and get a very accurate measure that will continue uh, for the rest of that uh, individual's life. Assu assuming something catastrophic doesn't happen, like they get in an accident and have brain damage, obviously. Okay, um, analytical and practical have a similar problem. I can't separate these from intelligence for the most part, all right? So people that score high on an IQ test, um, they uh, across the board score high on these. So if, if I'm saying that uh, these score exactly the same uh, as intelligence, are they really anything different? No, they're not necessarily anything different. These are just different labels that you're trying to attach to. And I get what, what they're trying to do here. They're trying to say analytical, okay. Uh, I could test for analytical because that's my simple solutions of like, here's one problem, one plus one equals, there's only one answer to that, that's two, uh, great. But whether that's <coughs> learned, like your crystallized intelligence or it's your fluid intelligence, uh, the ability to separate that from a, a practical application where there's multiple objectives or uh, options, high IQ people will score high in that as well. So it's not even measuring anything different uh, per se. Uh, the, the, the scores will be pretty much synonymous for the most part. All right, and yeah, you could weigh in your creativity a bit on the practical application, but there's no set of tests that clearly show that is a different um, set of skills than what is already just basic problem solving and ability, which you can measure with a standardized test. Now I get it, some people are resistant to just having like a, a written test uh, or even a verbal test because that's only one way of showing your knowledge. Fair enough, well, we can argue about that, but the measures that we have, and by the way, we've gone just beyond beyond just written tests, we'll talk about that when we talk about the tests themselves, but um, uh, it's gone beyond just that, uh, but fair enough, you can make an argument there, but we have, again, really, really, really accurate ways of measuring it, whether it's written or verbal, uh, or some more, other more uh, creative way, abstract way of showing your knowledge. Um, so again, these ones, again, uh, they're not really able to be separated from intelligence itself because they're both applying the same set of principles. I can see patterns, understand them in the world, apply them logically, uh, and then of course make accurate predictions. All right. So uh, these aren't necessarily testable, confirmable, uh, or reliable. And again, I can't really measure these things to look for success um, in um, uh, the realm of, of, of college and career success. So these ones are more or less out, but I I do have to present them to you, just like I did yesterday, uh, because they might be on the AP test. All right, uh, and again, in case we've forgotten, the practical uh, intelligence is your ability to use your knowledge in real life. So like the, oh, I've got a refrigerator, I've got to move it up three stories, there's multiple ways to do that. My practical intelligence would be how I can do that. Now, how do you measure that? That's a difficult one. How efficient it is, uh, how, much, how, many, how much energy you use, something like that. I'm not exactly sure, it's pretty abstract, but um, that's one way they would think of as practical, analytical, again, simple solutions, and creativity is just how novel your ideas are. Like, I think I gave you guys the example if I show you a picture, or like I drew a cube up here, uh, and then you guys all named it different things, like box, or cube, or square, or if you were more original, I guess you could say, cardboard box, or ice cube, or something like that, uh, to make it slightly more different, but uh, creativity, again, is not a good predictor um, of success. See, are you with me as, as to why these aren't really valid labels for intelligence? Like it's not actually measuring uh, what we're looking for or it's so identical that it's just really the same thing? Okay. All right. Last one that I didn't really have a chance to discuss, so I'll actually tell you more about what this means and then we'll go into why it's not accurate. Okay, so before I even start this, um, is somebody's the amount of stress somebody gets that they suffer from. Some people are more stressful than others, right? We've, you've seen this in life, like whether it's your mom or your dad or whoever, you can see individuals that they get stressed out and their anxiety eats away at them and there's some people that are just like, ah, it'll be fine, 
right? There's a huge range of like, whatever will be fine to, oh my gosh, this is such a big problem, I've got to solve it now. Like, there's a huge spectrum there. Um, we actually consider that, what, is that a personality trait or is that intelligence? Personality. It's a personality trait for the most part, right? Uh, intelligence tests are not necessarily able to measure your vulnerability to stress. Now, if you are stressed out, you will do a little worse on an intelligence test, fair enough. Uh, but these are things that we have not attributed to success in college or your career. Because are there careers I can choose that are less stressful than others? Yes. Absolutely, right? So my level of stress is not an accurate predictor for my career success. Uh, it's gonna vary depending on the job, which is again, something we've already uh, broken down to and defined as, as personality. So a lot of the emotional intelligence stuff here we're gonna talk about, it is synonymous <coughs> with personality. So if you control for somebody's personality and you take out the personality factor, uh, it, it leaves nothing there, essentially. Uh, so here's, here's a, three primary examples. Um, resistance to stress, that's actually a personality trait. We know that there's five of them, all right? Uh, we'll talk about this in unit seven, but there's five of them. There's openness to experience, how much you like seeing and doing new things. Conscientiousness, how orderly and productive you are and organized. Um, agreeableness, how polite and cooperative you are versus competitive and maybe a bit blunt. Uh, you've also got neuroticism, which is your uh, resistance to stress. So people who are higher in neuroticism are much more stressful or easily stressed, and people who are low in it are much more, uh, I don't wanna say carefree, but certainly emotionally stable. Like, uh, they're not as worried about things as somebody who is stressful. And, did I do four already? Yeah, and the last one is extroversion. Uh, basically, how much you like being out with attention on you, uh, and talking to and mingling with other people. So a highly extroverted person is someone who likes those things. They like attention. They like the positive emotion they get from interacting with people. An introvert uh, is kind of the opposite. They don't like it having attention on them. It actually drains energy from them to uh, interact with, with multiple people. And again, there's a whole spectrum there. Just You're not just like, you're an introvert or you're an extrovert. No, you uh, can rank within, in between them. Uh, those are all personality factors. So uh, my outgoingness, And my politeness or cooperativeness, I would say cooperative. These are all personality traits. We've already identified them. All right. The psychological community does not disagree on these five, for the most part, does not disagree on these five personality factors. Uh, and emotional intelligence considers these three. So uh, your resistance to stress is neuroticism. My outgoingness is extroversion. <coughs> And my cooperation uh, or cooperativeness is uh, agreeableness. All right, are those three in your brain, roughly speaking? What's my extroversion about? You have extroversion, right? Yep. It's like how um, it's like how you feel when other people are around. So extroverts would feel great when they're around people, and introverts would feel like they're being drained. Yep, your outgoingness and the uh, how much you like or dislike uh, attention would be your your degree of extroversion. Okay, cool. What about my neuroticism? What's that one talking about? Yep, and that's just one factor, but yes, uh, your emotional stability. So people who are prone to stress and anxiety, they are not very, what you call, emotionally stable and constant. So yes, uh, neuroticism would be uh, your ability to resist or unfortunately succumb to stress and anxiety and other uh, mood, um, moods and disorders, mood disorders. Okay, um, what about my agreeableness? What's my agreeableness about? Yeah, my politeness, my niceness, my cooperate, cooperation, my capacity to be cooperate, cooperative. Um, what would be a disagreeable person then? Someone who is impolite, not kind, they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, they might be blunt, but also competitive too. Uh, are cooperative people generally very competitive? No. no. I mean, obviously if they're on a team and they're versus another team, they could be cooperative in a competitive sense, but let's pretend there's no teams, you're just at a business. Uh, are, are they going to be willing to cooperate with the people that they're also competing against? 
No, they're not going to help you out because they're, you know, wanting to do better, essentially. Okay. So, uh, hold on, before I forget to get, give you guys money. Where's the sheet for this? Is it on my desk? It is? catch up on yours. Okay. And then you had one, you had one. Missing anybody? Just you three so far? You had one? Which one did you have? You did answer something. I don't remember what you answered. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt because I do remember you answering something. Okay. So um, <laughs> if I were to take an intelligence test, for emotional intelligence, which I'll get into in a second, I shouldn't be able to just also take a personality test and remove those factors from them or have them be the same thing. All right, because if, if I'm trying to measure intelligence and I'm, in my, and I'm weighing any of these, I'm, uh, that's not intelligence, that's a personality trait. All right, so if I, again, if I take some intelligence test and they align perfectly with any one of these three, that's not intelligence as we have chosen to define it. All right, that is, measuring a personality trait and we would actually throw that out and unfortunately what happens is when you when you test for what I'm about to describe here on emotional intelligence if you factor these three in if you control for them and take those out it leaves this with essentially nothing because uh, this is really just another way of saying how your personality may affect your life essentially but we already know that we have personality tests for that we have factored out the five and, and we can already do that that is not the same thing as intelligence and it doesn't predict your career or college success. So here's emotional intelligence. It's basically your ability to, um, how is it phrased? Understand other people's emotions, see them uh, and understand them, see and understand emotions of yourself, by the way, uh, and others. And then how to uh, essentially, I think I'm skipping a step. You see them and perceive them. And you understand them, and then you use them. I skipped one. There's a fourth step in there. Managing. Managing. There we go. Okay. So then you uh, you see and understand them. Uh, you manage your own emotions, or maybe theirs, and then you're going to, of course, use uh, them to uh, enhance cooperation and success. And uh, what they say is. Managing, of course, is, a, uh, is, is synonymous with neuroticism. So let's say I, uh, I am stressed out. If I let that overwhelm me, that's me not managing my emotions, essentially. So if I control this test and I take all the things that align perfectly with neuroticism, which they do in this category anyway for management, those go out. Uh, I'm left with that whole category is essentially missing. All right. Uh, the other one about uh, using them uh, for cooperation and success that one is, well, maybe you can tell me, which one does that sound like uh, on all of these here? Cooperative. Cooperativeness, okay, so that, what personality trait would that be? Agreeable. Agreeableness. And emotional intelligence, by the way, it, it, set, it claims that people that are higher in emotional intelligence that can uh, see and understand to others, manage their own and others, and then use them to promote cooperation and, and uh, uh, get more help from others, essentially be more successful. It's actually not true at all. If you actually, uh, control for um, uh, what's it called agreeableness it turns out that and this probably isn't much of a surprise to you competitive people do better in college and in their careers than people who are uh, cooperative it's not like you know massive difference but there is a slight statistical advantage to those that are uh, competitive and disagreeable why do you think that might be They are, they're more driven to improve themselves and enhance their success or status. And uh, they're also more willing to take risks too. So if I'm a, if I'm a cooperative, polite person and we're, we're, in a, we're in some sort of meeting, I don't know, we're making some decision about a product or our business or whatever, um, if I have something to say that goes against the opinions of others, if I'm really agreeable, am I more or less likely to voice my opinion that goes against what they're saying? I'm less likely, right, by far. So um, even if I, if I do voice my opinion, I might not be well received. People not, might not like that. There might be some tension uh, and awkwardness, and that might affect my uh, neuroticism as well and include that. But uh, the people that do speak up and stand up for themselves and, and voice uh, dissenting opinions despite the reaction they get, they tend to improve things for themselves uh, and for the group. 
So that's why it can be dangerous if you're too nice in a group because then if there's a bad idea, people are less likely to speak up about why it might be a bad idea. Uh, and we find, uh, again, and it's not every single profession, but most professions, uh, the people that are less agreeable tend to do better as far as like um, uh, their standing in a company or their salaries and, and things like that. They get more promotions, uh, they get more raises because they're more willing to go up and say, no, 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 I want this thing, you need to give it to me or I'm gonna go, right? They're the ones that sometimes they end up going. Fair enough, right? Can't give you the raise, sorry. Then they go, all right, bye. And then they go get it somewhere else. Uh, but then they also are the ones that the people say, okay, we well, actually need this person, so let's actually give them the raise, and they get it. Whereas the agreeable person doesn't go out and get the raise, or they say, sorry, we can't give it, and they go, oh, okay, you know, thanks for listening to me or whatever, and they don't end up getting the raise. <clears throat> so uh, this one is wrong on two levels. Number one, uh, this is really just measuring my agreeableness. So if I factor in agreeableness, this whole thing is just removed and it's left with nothing. But also, it's false in its, uh, in its proposition that uh, being more polite and friendly and cooperative uh, equals more success. That is actually not true if you're looking at uh, people's ranks in a company or their actual salaries, unfortunately. <clears throat> it's a good thing to know, by the way, if you are agreeable, that if you are going to try to do better for yourself, because there's nothing wrong with that, by the way, at least to some degree, uh, you're going to have to at least be disagreeable when you're trying to negotiate for a promotion or a raise or something like that. So you have to be willing to tell your employer, no, I don't accept that answer. I need more or I'm going to go even though that might mean that they don't like you because of that or, it's, or there's a contentious situation, you're, you're gonna have to learn to uh, deal with that and be assertive. Okay, so those are out. Those are just personality factors. Once you exclude those, this whole thing falls apart and the predictions are invalid. Uh, but also, the outgoingness. So my ability to uh, uh, see and understand others' emotions would mean that I'd have to, of course, go out there and find out what they are. This wouldn't apply at all to a job if I was just by myself at a desk. Right? Or if I was in a, in a, a career where um, I'm not actually interacting with people, right? or I'm only interacting with one person at a time as opposed to many. Um, that's going to uh, basically exclude those professions. But also, um, my outgoingness isn't necessarily related to my success either. Uh, in fact, when we look at personality, whether you're introverted or extroverted, it doesn't really have any impact on your performance in college nor does it have your performance in careers. In specific fields it might, like obviously I'm not gonna be a very good public speaker probably if I'm an introvert, and I'm probably not gonna be a very good accountant sitting there at a desk if I'm an extrovert because I'll be bored out of my mind. I'm gonna to wanna to talk to people and see people, but if I'm stuck in a cubicle, I can't do that. Um, so profession to profession, certainly, and that's what personality is, but across the board, no. It has no accurate measure or predictor. Um, so unfortunately, while this is a, a, a a noble attempt, I suppose, to expand the domain of intelligence. Uh, these are actually measures for personality. And when you control for the personality and you take out those factors, uh, it has nothing to stand on whatsoever. So this emotional intelligence thing, not really a, a creditable intelligence, but nonetheless, this is how you would use it um, on the AP test, is being around and seeing other, other people's emotions, understanding them, uh, managing your own emotions and maybe even others, and then using them to benefit yourself uh, and the group. All right, and then they do try to say that that makes you more successful in your career, which we actually know is not true. There are some careers where that might be more successful. For example, I'd probably be a better, I would probably be a better nurse if I'm agreeable, because I'm there to help you and be there for you to make you feel better and feel comfortable and have what you need to, 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 to live as far as nutrition medication goes. Or if you're with little kids, um, that might be better to be understanding and helpful and, and model that, that politeness because you don't want these kids to be these antisocial little guys that go around telling people you know, terrible things and, and, and misbehaving. Uh, but uh, overall, it doesn't. Also, there's one other thing I wanna mention here too. This says that my ability to understand your situation and act compassionately and empathetically is a form of intelligence. But here's the thing, and this is a good point that uh, one psychologist brought up, I can't remember who it was, but uh, they brought up an excellent point. I could very well be somebody who is very intelligent and which allows them to be able to easily understand, you know, that people are upset, they can see it like in your body language, your tone, they might even know why. But does that mean that they care why you might be upset? No. Right? That's not an intelligence. I could know exactly why you're upset or if you're upset or not, but if I don't care, does that mean I don't have emotional intelligence? Like, well, I can identify it, 
and maybe I could manipulate it if I wanted to, to to help get what I wanted, but if I don't genuinely care about it, does that mean I don't have emotional intelligence? Because that absolutely exists. Like sociopaths and psychopaths like live off of that stuff, right? You don't have to be a psychopath or a sociopath. You can see someone's upset, but you might not care, you know, necessarily, right? You're like, okay, well, sucks for them, I guess, but it's not any of my business, right? So you can see these things, but if you don't feel the empathy, that means you don't have the actual intelligence, no. That's just uh, agreeableness. People that are high in agreeableness uh, can see that just like disagreeable people, people can, but then that actually causes them to want to help them because they either feel guilty if they don't help them or they feel good if they do. Whereas a disagreeable person, they could see it just fine and know it, but it doesn't impact them so they don't care to you know, offer help uh, or as much help as an agreeable person would. All right, so that's why this one is just a completely muffed up version of it, at least according to uh, uh, most leaders in the field of psychology. Nonetheless, uh, you need to know what it is. So be good on the emotional intelligence stuff. Okay, uh, cultural impacts. So this isn't like saying there are different intelligences. I should say application. Um, our measures for intelligence are cross-cultural. Uh, I can accurately predict with these tests, assuming they can read the language that it's in. I can accurately predict how people will perform regardless of the culture in their uh, in university or in their careers, so long as there's not like some rigid caste system that doesn't allow you to make a certain amount of money or have a certain job. Uh, if you're like in, uh, you know, India prior to the 19th century when they had that rigid Hindu caste system, some places in Southeast Asia too. Uh, there are many places in China prior to the 20th century where women didn't have a lot of opportunity. So like I could score very well on an IQ test as a, world, a woman in, in 19th century China, but I ain't going nowhere in career just because they have these you know, social impediments uh, to you as far as allowing you to make a certain amount of money or, or, or a job. But if we assume that people can do whatever they want to do, these tests uh, accurately predict how well they'll do uh, in, a, in a free market system uh, or in university. So, the intelligence is the same, but they are genuinely or generally applied slightly differently. So here's what I mean by this: um, in the West <clears throat> and most free market um, uh, economies, I need to drink water. Do they tend to care more about the individual and how they do, or do they can tend to care more about others and how the group and community do? Individual. More so individual, right? Not solely individual. But we, we, we think of it like this, here's the world to us. There's me, there's those around me, there's my family, and there's the community, and it, and it expands outward, right? Um, this isn't a perfect way of describing it, but the way that other collectivist cultures, whereas, and they use the term the East from, uh, in, in the textbook, it's kind of flipped. First you look at like your family and community, and then it expands out. And then on the outer rim, the one that you care about less and less, generally speaking, is the individual. All right, so in the West, um, intelligence is def usually a tool uh, used to advance uh, individual success. Uh, and generally speaking, what you want to be able to do is engage in, in rational debate. So you should be able to go in and say, I think the problem is this, and this is why I believe this is the problem. That gets people to listen to you, generally speaking. Uh, and if they can't refute it, that probably means it's at least worth trying or it's correct. Uh, individual success as well as rational debate, right? And that's how we use the intelligence um, um, in your career or in college. You basically take in the information, the patterns, you apply rational logic, uh, rationality and logic to it, and you try to predict the outcomes, right? And that's what you would do. So you do that process and you try to explain it to convince somebody uh, by using reason. All right, in the East, how do you think the East is gonna try to use intelligence? <coughs> Yes, it's much more about maintaining uh, cohesiveness, cooperation, um, um, and uh, stabilizing the group, essentially. So you care far less about your individual stake or position or workload and much more about maintaining the uh, uh, peace, cohesion, stability of, of your family or your company or your community or your state, whatever it might be. So uh, uh, used to maintain group or collective cohesion, cooperation, uh, and stability. All right, and this isn't, uh, this isn't like any sort of racial or ethnic critique, by the way. This is a purely cultural thing. Any individual across the world 
can be raised in a Western culture and, and, and think and use intelligence this way. Any individual, regardless of their race or gender, can be raised in a culture that uh, uh, features more of a collective uh, mindset and they can grow up to uh, use the tools that way. So this isn't any sort of racial claim or something like that. It's purely cultural, right? You can throw any person into these cultures and then they'll, they'll use it this way because that's essentially how they're raised to use it. Um, we ha it has been shown though that the one, the, the approach that is generally better for uh, helping out even society as a whole, but coming up with a lot more uh, innovations and solving problems is this approach purely because this is the one where if you think there's a problem, you voice it. This is all about avoiding conflict uh, and promoting cooperation. But like I said, if we're having a meeting about something for our company and we're gonna go put out a new product or whatever, and I think that there's, and I have a good reason for it, I think something's wrong with that idea or something should be changed, I'm much more likely to voice it if this is my mindset than if that's my mindset, all right? And that can mean you catch more problems this way uh, than potentially this way. But that can be, this can be problematic too because this could just be caught and, and, and bogged down uh, by people complaining and arguing too much, which does happen. But for whatever reason, the way it plays out is this generally comes to generate slightly more solutions than it does waste time arguing, all right? But they, they both have their, their pros and cons. And again, that's not a racial statement or an ethnic statement. These are just abstract cultural mechanisms. Anyone could grow up in, in either of these and, and see the world that way. All right. Okay. Um, any questions about intelligence or how we apply it? Sweet. Uh, let's take a break then, and I'll talk about intelligence tests after, even though I've already talked about them, kind of.